Welcome to another edition of Now What with me, Robert Peston. I'm delighted today to be joined by, some would say, the most powerful trade union leader in Britain, Len McCluskey, leader of the enormous Unite Union. Equally, some would say the most powerful, one of the most powerful people in British politics, because he's a huge influence on the Labour Party. Len McCluskey, very good to see you today. Let's just talk about the day job uh, running a trade union. Recent statistics show that trade union membership as a proportion of the workforce has fallen again. There's been this long term decline going all the way back to the 1970s. Why haven't you been able to reverse that decline? I think, first of all, the uh, figures can be misleading. I mean, the truth of the matter is that uh, these figures are often um, spewed out in order to give the impression that trade unions are irrelevant. They're not as important in society as... Uh, that, as that's certainly not a point that I'm making here. No, I'm just... I, know, I know you're not making yeah. it. The point I'm trying to make is that actually if you look at the trade union density mm. in many of the major sectors of the economy, you will find that trade union density is extremely high. Steel, automotive, civil aviation, chemicals, energy. Uh, and that's before we get into the public services where, of course, NHS and local authorities and education. You're talking about major sectors of the economy that drive the economy, which uh, where we've got trade union density of 70, 80 percent in our railways, for example, probably 100 percent. The fact is that once you start putting into the mix the zero hour contracts, the bogus self-employment, agency labour, precarious work, the gig economy, then of course there's a rapid decline. And that's really the issue that trade unions have as a challenge. How can we get involved in those sectors that are very low paid, transient workforce, difficult to actually create a collective mentality amongst that workforce. And of course, the trade union laws restrict us enormously in doing that. But, but let's, let's, let's drill down into that a bit. But, but you know, f first of all, I, I would never describe, obviously, the kind of industries where trade unions are strong as legacy industries, but they are the older industries and they are the industries where still you have these more traditional forms of employment. Part of the changes in employment practices, some would say, are the result of unscrupulous, sometimes rapacious bosses putting people on very insecure work for no other reason yeah. than it maximises profits. But some of the change is technologically driven. There are people who genuinely want to be self-employed and they want to work in these new industries. These so, you know, working for, you know, these various platforms, you know, whether it's Uber or something like that, they choose some of them, not all of them, to be self-employed. Um, so how do you get, how do you, how do you get to organise those people? I think, I think, first of all, very, very few people choose to be on zero hour contracts or in precarious employment. Sure. So it's and one I, of the great it's one of the great scourges in our economy today. It's what has happened over a long period of time where this much lauded flexible labour market has been used to effectively reduce the power of working people, uh, employment rights, and has made it extremely difficult for trade unions uh, to organise. But what is, the, what is the role, though, of trade unions? I mean, traditionally, well, the, the, the role of trade unions has been to improve labour standards across the board. Of course it is. But so how do, you, how do you make yourself relevant to those Well, then you've just touched upon the most important word. Uh, trade unions have to be relevant to working people's lives. First of all, I take issue that uh, the areas I'm talking about are old, declining industries. These are the industries that power the whole of our economy. You can't call, and of course, have been subjected to technological change themselves, which is why there has been a decline. There's been a decline in traditional trade union areas because of the advent of new technology and the globalisation of the world and what happened in the 80s with virtually all our uh, companies being sold off. It was like a, a car boot sale when Mrs Thatcher said, come on in and take what you want. And they did. Foreign companies, very difficult to find a British company these days. So that decline has been a long-term uh, decline. 
But these are still incredibly relevant sectors. The whole economy would come to a standstill. We'd have no public services. We'd have no private services if it wasn't for those. It, it, it won't surprise you that, that, that for all sorts of reasons, I'm going to come back and talk to you about the role of trade unions within manufacturing industry, within the public sector. I, you know, so I'm, I'm definitely not avoiding the question of how important both those public services and those industries are. But, but I do want to get some sense from you how of we... whether there is a role for a union like Unite in representing people who are self-employed or are on the, in these very unstable, unreliable contracts. Very, very difficult. I mean, the truth is, Robert, that we don't have magic wands. And of course, when we are fighting in the political arena to eliminate zero hour contracts, which is a despicable uh, manifestation of the individual greed that uh, exists within our society. When we argue for greater control of agency labour, back in the day when agency labour that you and I would recall was used, it was used on the basis of uh, um, if there was an increase in demand, ups and downs, companies would bring in uh, agency workers for a, a small period of time. Now, agency workers work in companies for four, five, ten years, uh, permanent workers, and yet they are still agency workers without any full employment rights. And we are constantly trying to organise them in a specific workplace. If you take the gig economy, mm. predominantly young people, yep. or you take our hospitality sector where there's all kinds of abuses taking place, we've currently got a dispute with TGI Fridays, yep. our, our young men and women who are having basically their tips stolen from them by this company that's run by hedge funds and we are we've become relevant to them and hundreds have now joined our union in order to fight for their rights now this is in difficult circumstances my sister union the gmb took uh, Uber to court in order to kind of declare that Uber drivers were actually employed. And they won. And they won. The problem is then how do you empower them? Because to empower people it can only be done through collectivism and therefore the battles that are taking place out there are the same that used to take place in many of our major industries, battling for fairness and decency and justice. Working people, no matter where they work, they just want to be treated with respect. That's my experience in nearly 50 years that I've been representing working people. That one common thing, they want to be respected by their employer. And unfortunately, we live in a world now that has slowly drifted down and that respect isn't there. Now, trade unions do their best. We have limited resources and we fight against trade union laws that make us the worst protected workers in the whole of Europe. How can it be possible that the very nation that gave Europe all of the freedoms that they currently have at the having defeated fascism at the end of the Second World War, we gave Europe all of what they currently have. How is it possible that German workers have got better protections now than British workers? Spanish, French, Italian, Dutch. Why have they got better protections? Because consecutive governments have chosen to try to attack trade unions in order to make it easier for the corporate elite, the greedy bosses, to abuse workers and maximise profits. That said, there's obviously a, a very interesting balance you've got to strike between representing workers in the workplace and your political work, as it were, trying to get the law changed. Now, um, one of the things that is sort of striking to me at the moment is you have a union, Unite, big supporter of the Labour Party, big donor. You personally have been a very big supporter of, of, of Jeremy Corbyn recently. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a Labour Party whose position is that if they win an election, they would restore quite a lot of power to trade unions, including, uh, for example, something which I don't think we've ever really seen in this country, which is within the private sector, industry-wide negotiations on, on pay, very much what, what, like what they do in Germany, for, no, we, for, for, we for, 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 for example. We used to have that. 
We used to have that, Robert. We used to have national joint industrial councils. I sat on a number of them myself, which uh, negotiated with employers over a whole sector. Yes, uh, the, the reality is, of course, that if you look at what's happened in our, um, in our society over a period of time, your excellent book, uh, WTF, has kind of indicated the decline, the letdown, uh, that you personally felt about how um, the organisations and the way of life had basically let down the hope that you had. You come up with a brilliant phrase that um, uh, 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 about uh, stripped of optimism. Uh, millions of people stripped. Uh, it, it, it is stripped, a huge problem in this country. Is stripped that people, of optimism. Is that people don't any longer have hope that their lives are going. And, there, to get and you've just, but, 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 but hang on, sorry, Robert, please. you've just you've just mentioned the other key word. Mm. Not only stripped of op optimism, but we're still stripped of hope. Yeah. Now the trade unions, if you look at the correlation between the decline in how much our um, our GDP, the wealth that we create, went into the back pockets of workers. It has declined from 65% yeah, sure. to 52%. Percent. As an economist, you would know that that is an absolute disaster for sustainable growth in our economy. That has ran in parallel with the decline of power, the attacks on trade unions. And so when Mrs May talks about she wants to do something for the, the people who are just managing and she wants to give a voice to workers, at the same time, she introduces more laws. The Trade Union Act, which Vince Cable and David Davis said was deeply unnecessary to restrict trade unions even further. So when the Labour Party come along and say, we're going to give back the power of working people, of organised labour, trade unions are the biggest voluntary organisation in our country. They speak for working people. Uh, we're going to give back those powers on a level playing field with our brothers and sisters in Europe. Not better, but just bringing us back to a level playing field. But, but, the, but, but there is a paradox, and this is what I wanted, wanted to get on to. You will have seen the opinion polls, which shows an extraordinary surge, extraordinary by historical standards, a surge in support for the Tory party from working class voters. So why, why is a Tory party that you say is attacking the workers, why are they getting this support? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that Brexit has played a key role in this. We've seen during the last year's general election, uh, which way we've seen constantly, the media used to put people on who, yeah, I've voted Labour all my life, but I'm, voted, I'm voting Conservative because I trust them to take us out of Europe. I don't trust Labour. Now, that's a problem and we have to do something about that. Labour has to make it clear that the only party, the only party that can bring about a Brexit and can bring about the wishes of the nation, both the 52% and the 48%, is Labour. But why don't the working classes who traditionally supported Labour, why don't they believe Labour? I mean, I've spent quite a lot of time in the North East and have been genuinely astonished that people who've worked in heavy industries all their lives, um, and, and arguably you could say that the decline in those industries is actually more to do with traditional Tory governments than with Labour governments, but nonetheless they are not supporting Labour at the moment and they are supporting the Tories. But I think that's purely around the issue of coming out of the European Union. And what Corbyn... But what is it, but what uh, is it about the Tory party on Brexit that they trust and well, they don't I, I trust suspect, Labour. I suspect you've been talking to people who voted Leave and the reality is they're unsure about whether Labour will actually comply with the wishes of the British electorate. Now, for me, I would urge Jeremy and the leadership team in, in Labour uh, and they have been trying to make it clear, I wish they'd do it more powerfully, that Labour will take, if Labour were in power tomorrow, Labour would take uh, the, um, the UK out of the European Union. However, so that, that's an issue that's already been done. The British people have voted to come out of the European Union. The real key is on what basis and what agreements. Mm. Now, Mrs May made a, she made a number of terrible errors, of course, calling a, an early general election last year was the biggest. But she also made a huge mistake after the referendum result in creating a, an aggressive tone 
uh, with the EU. Basically, it was as though we were going to tell them what was going to happen, and and they reacted accordingly. I remember, uh, Robert, I speak to uh, my sister unions, the leaders of unions all over Europe, mm. who speak to their ministers, mm. and their ministers tell them, look, we want an agreement with, uh, with the UK, but the manner in which they're conducting themselves, first of all, we don't know what they're looking for, because they're too busy negotiating with themselves. Um, and also their arrogance is such that it gets a reaction from the other 27 uh, European nations. Now, if we'd have had, as an example, a Labour victory last year, I believe now Corbyn would have concluded an agreement for us to leave Brexit that would have spoken for the whole nation, both the 48% because Labour would, like, uh, would seek... Uh, uh, tariff-free access to the single market and a customs union, therefore protecting jobs and investment, which is very key as far as I'm concerned. And to the 52%, you have to analyse why did they, the, the colleague, people you spoke to in the North East, why did they vote to leave? The, the uh, opinions that we have is for two major reasons. One, they felt that they'd been left behind. Um, what's Europe ever done to us? Lots of areas where there's industrial uh, wastelands. Labour, but, 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 but let me but, fear, but Why do they but, blame Europe for that? Because but, there's almost, I mean, there's, you, you, arguably there forget, is no evidence that it's got anything to do with Europe. Robert, forget, why did they blame it? That is one of the reasons. I'm not saying they're right. What I'm saying is that Labour have a policy to deal with that, a real industrial strategy that deals with a national investment bank and regional investment banks to start investing in these communities. The second reason why people left was undoubtedly the question of immigration, or to be more specific, um, the question of migrant labour. And Labour is the only party that speaks to that. Jeremy Corbyn has said when we leave the European Union, uh, the free movement of Labour from Europe will stop. Also, as the government says. But, uh, but what, what Labour do and what Theresa May has completely been absent in, what Labour says, but obviously it has to be replaced by something else. And the agreement we will have will allow uh, migrants to still come in, migrant workers to still come in, but there will be labour market regulations so that the exploitation of migrant workers by greedy bosses, because migrant workers are to blame for nothing in this country, the greedy bosses who use them to undercut paying conditions, that would stop because Labour would introduce labour market regulations to stop it. They'd abol abolish zero hours, they'd control agency labour. We've got situations where agency companies will only take onto their books um, migrant workers. They won't take indigenous people onto their books. It's criminal. It's almost like... So what, it's what almost like. Say, but there are quite a lot of, again, working class voters who don't trust Labour on this issue of immigration, what would you say to them to persuade them? I would, I would say to them that Labour is the only party capable of dealing with concerns about migrant workers without blaming migrant workers. If you have labour market regulations, here's the truth, if you have proper labour market regulations where the greedy bosses can't abuse migrant workers, then there would be a massive reduction of migrant workers coming into the country. Because if, if the greedy bosses can't abuse them, they won't use them. They won't use them. And that's the reality but, of Labour and the Tories. The Tories say nothing about this. Now, unfortunately, this is a very complicated picture when it comes to what British people really think about Europe. You face complexities in managing your own union on this issue. So, for example, you were talking about how union membership in many manufacturing industries, steel, automotive, is high. Mm -hmm. Now, those industries are terrified of a hard Brexit. Um, you know, and uh, what is very striking, very striking, is neither the Tories nor Labour are actually offering those industries no, what they think they that's need not true, Robert. For, for, for frictionless trade. Well, Robert, that's not true. Labour are saying that if we were negotiating now,
we would negotiate tariff-free access. I deal with all of the... It's not just tariffs. It is. It's, it's not just tariffs. No. It's also regulatory standards. Absolutely. It's That's... across the piece uh -huh, but... of the single market and the customs union. And Labour... Uh, look, the truth is, Labour is not signed up to the single market and it's sort of half signed That's up to the true. customs union. That's not true. That isn't true. And by the way, I don't blame you for this. I blame the Labour Party for not clarifying its position. But Labour's... I speak to all of the major manufacturing companies yep. in, in this country. Yep. And they all have been to meetings with them all, uh, whether it be Airbus or cool. JLR or Nissan, all of them yep. are saying we are deeply worried about a hard Brexit. Yep. Uh, what Labour are effectively saying, if we were now negotiating, if Corbyn was now negotiating, we would get an agreement that would give us access to a tariff-free uh, um, single market and a customs agreement, which would protect jobs and investment. The companies and I So just to be to... clear, your view, because this is not said clearly by the Labour front bench, your view is that... In their hearts, the Labour front branch, Jeremy Corbyn, Keir Starmer, are in favour of membership in a proper not sense membership. of the customs union. Not membership. And it's, well, you've got to be a member of a customs union. No, you have to be a member of a customs union. No, you can't, no, you can't no, no, just... No. Well, customs union is a customs union. You have to be a member of a customs union. No, 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 no. The, the word membership is... Uh, it, it, it's a small word, but it's an important word. We cannot be members of the single market or no, the no, customs a, union. No, no, but we're out of well, the a, customs union anyway. We're, we're fine, just out of it, but, fine. but it's so, a customs union. So you replace it, yes, with a customs union. An but, it has to wrap, but it has to replicate the current customs well, union. Well, it has to be an agreement that both the UK and the Europeans will agree to. Same as access to, the, to a tariff-free market. That is what Labour's policy is. If I, 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 but what's wrong? But okay, because I, I know that these things sometimes have a habit of, you know, going into some sort of dreadful semi-religious. Nobody quite understands what's going on. Argument, but th there is a model. Okay, uh, it's the model that Norway uses. It's you know the European Economic Area. What is wrong? with being a member of the European Economic Because you effectively are a member of an organisation that you have no say in. And it would be effectively against what the wishes of the British people are. Why? But, why why well, do you know what the well, wishes of the British people well, are? Well, because they voted 52% no, 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 to 48 but to come but out. out. But you're out of the European Union at No, that no, point. no, no. Look, the mistake that you're making is trying to believe that you can just pull something off a shelf like the Norwegian model or the Canadian model and say, well... But you basically... You agree with the Prime Minister? Then, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, well, I'm not quite sure the Prime Minister knows what she wants, to be honest, but we can come on to that. The reality is that what we want is our own agreement, not a Norway agreement, but a UK agreement. A UK agreement that gives us the access tariff free to the market. That but regulatory alignment, I mean, would, would we still take rules and regulations for standards for goods, standards for services from the for EU? Ma uh, for many of them, we would, because that's what I believe. The, see, why do people vote to leave? They yeah. didn't vote to leave so that we could do away with the regulations to fly our aeroplanes, to deal with our security. Sure. They dealt for these two major reasons, industrially being left behind, I think Labour speak to that, and the question of migrant labour. I think Labour speak with labour market regulations that would have a huge impact. So all of the other issues, I believe we would have a very close relationship with our European partners, but it would be our agreement. It would be an agreement, not a Norway agreement, not a Canadian agreement, but a UK agreement. But that what's would... really... OK, but here's a striking thing, OK? The, there are lots of people who criticise what the Prime Minister wants to do because it basically would, if accepted by the EU, and it's not clear that the EU will accept it, but it would um, provide so-called frictionless access for manufacturing and for food producers as well. So mm -hmm. no tariffs on um, goods and food flowing back and forth. No. No, and, and, and no checks at the borders because the regulations yep. and rules yep. affecting Ma making a consumption of goods, making a consumption of food would be the same. And so it would still be like being in the single market for manufacturing. Now, many trade union members 
must surely welcome that because they're in those industries and they will benefit well, when from I that. See, well, uh, Robert, so, 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 Robert, so you must welcome that, must well, you? Of course. When I see the details of it, yeah. of course I will welcome that. I don't know what the details are at the moment. And the problem that we have, and remember, nearly 80% of our economy is service sector, which we're told will have more mm. flexible mm. Uh, uh, agreements. Uh, we don't know. We don't know what the Prime Minister's but interesting, check is but, but, inter but interestingly... It's in the. I, I'm just simply interested now in in what the role, what the attitude of trade unions should be. Obviously, there are trade unions if in, 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 in in service sectors, but actually, trade unions are less represented in private sector service industries than they are in traditional manufacturing, as yes, it were. Yes, so you okay. could argue that the prime minister is, is, you know, basically doing a deal that's good for you and your members. What has effectively happened here, and we'll see what the white paper says, because bluntly there is an enormous amount of confusion still. Mm. But what appears to be happening is that the Prime Minister is moving towards a softer Brexit. That is welcomed by me because my members in manufacturing mm. and the companies I deal with are deeply worried about that particular issue, as we all should be. It's not just manufacturing that is uh, impacted by that. In so do you think Labour should help her? No, I don't. I think Labour have adopted a correct position by saying this is what we would do. We're not in power. You're the ones negotiating. We think you're making a mess of it. Everybody thinks you're making a mess of it. This is what we would do. And you need to come back with a particular agreement that we believe is good for the nation and good for the economy. At the moment, I'm going to go back to mm. the question of the free movement of Labour and yeah. so-called immigration. The Prime Minister and the Tories have said nothing. Here's my prediction. If they get away, if she gets away with implementing some uh, botched together uh, mm. deal that uh, that the Tory MPs vote for because they're scared stiff of going to uh, another general election. I believe that the question of immigration and, and, and migrant workers will increase. The Tories have always looked historically for a cheap pool of labour. Now, a ch cheap labour is not just a UK problem, it's a European problem. We've been speaking to our uh, colleagues in Europe, the Labour Party have been speaking to socialist parties in Europe about this very issue. The Tories will do nothing about that. And the very people who voted Leave and Labour supporters now who say, oh no, I, I trust the Tories, very quickly will realise that the reasons that they voted to leave, being left behind industrially, concerns about uh, migrant workers, the Tories will do nothing about it. There is no industrial strategy to invest in our communities in the northern heartlands or the Midlands, none whatsoever. But, okay, let's, but let's just, let, okay, I want, to pick, I want to pick up on that. Let's just start, though, by going back to the election which you described as an election that was a huge mistake by Theresa May because she lost her majority. Mm -hmm. right? Now, the authoritative British election study says that the overwhelming reason why Labour did well in that election, obviously their manifesto was liked by a lot of people, obviously Jeremy Corbyn was liked by a lot of people, but the British election study says that the biggest reason people voted for Labour was they thought that the Tories were heading for a hard Brexit and they thought that Labour would have a softer, a more pro-EU approach. So in that sense, it was almost a rerun of the European referendum. Right? Now, interestingly, in that election, as you know, lots of working class people also voted Tory. Labour became much more of a middle class party in that election in that sense. <laughs> so, uh, so, a couple of questions. A, what do you feel about that? <laughs> I feel that, like... that, that. Number one. But number two, there is an argument that says, somebody like Andrew Adonis has been making this, that if Labour actually wants to win the next election, they should become the party campaigning for another referendum yes. and do all the industrial strategy stuff that you want them to do. Combine the two approaches. Oh, the reality... And that would form a coalition of middle classes and working classes. I think the reality is that if Labour started campaigning for a second referendum, it would be a disaster. But why would it be a disaster? Because we have had a vote. We very, very rarely have referendums in, this, uh, in, in our nation. Very rarely. And when you have one, you have to abide by the result. And that's the reality of it. These so, people, right, but you, 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 very, you, your choice of words is very careful there. You said if Labour started campaigning for a second referendum, it would be a disaster. 
are there circumstances in which it would be rational for the Labour Party to say, right, we're at a certain point, it now makes sense for there to be a In my system. opinion, in my opinion, there are circumstances where the Labour Party, and certainly this is my union's yeah. policy, yeah. Uh, would consider trying to press for whatever deal, uh, going back to the people, mm. for the people to vote, not to vote whether they wanted to stay in Europe, mm. um, They've already voted on that. We're coming out of Europe. But what would a vote? What would a vote on a deal actually achieve? Because it would, if it went, if it went down, it would mean that effectively not only would Theresa May step down, but there would be a likelihood of a general election. Well, that would that would that would obviously be true. But it would also, wouldn't it, deliver something that you would presumably hate? which would be crashing out of the European Union you know, without a deal at all. Not necessarily. If you looked at a scenario that said that the deal has been defeated, I'd prefer the deal to be defeated in Parliament. I'd mm. prefer the parliamentarians to... But just, but just because you just think it's impossible, it's impossible to give the British people a say on whether they actually, now that they know more about it, whether they actually want to stay in the EU. No, That's I think, impossible. I, 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 I think it's wrong. I think it sounds a little bit like Bertolt Brecht's uh, if the people uh, haven't got it right, then re-elect the people. I, I, I don't think you can do that. I genuinely don't. I think what you've got to do yeah. is accept the uh, results, but then say it's not the end of the world. We can now negotiate uh, a kind of deal that will make everybody feel as though they've been properly represented and alleviate many of the fears. That's what I think Labour should do. And in my opinion, the Conservative Party um, have demonstrated that, frankly, they uh, don't have the ability or the capability to do that. They are uh, really uh, embarrassing. I don't say that with any great glee. I've got no personal... Uh, animosity towards Theresa May. I didn't particularly like David Cameron, but I, I wouldn't say that about Theresa May. I don't know her well enough, and she seems uh, a reasonable enough person, but she's a disaster. She's been a disaster. She's been a disaster in terms of the manner in which she's approached to these negotiations, a disaster in kind of calling an election that has left everybody. She has no authority in her own party, and therefore you negotiate. Okay, but I, Robert, let me just say sure. this very quickly. I'm a negotiator. For 50 years, I've negotiated. And when you go into negotiations, you have to have the respect of the people you're sitting opposite. You have to have uh, a, an ability uh, to talk with some authority. That, uh, that ability is simply not there. It is a disaster, the position that we find ourselves in and how European unions and uh, co countries um, and leaders see us. But, but if she's... If she's such a disaster, why isn't Labour massively ahead in the polls? Well, I think Labour has done remarkable. You'll know that the election last year was called on the basis that Labour was going to get wiped out. Remember, we'd had the Parliamentary Labour Party, or a substantial number of them, constantly stabbing uh, Corbyn in the back and, and a vote to no confidence. The British people are wondering what the hell's going on. The one thing that we know is they don't like a divided party. Theresa May thought she was going to get a hundred, a, a minimum 80 majority. People were talking about 100, 150. Labour being wiped out forever. Corbyn pulled off one of the most incredible, incredible political feats that we've ever seen. The jump, the few, jump from... Sure, the, few, well, did, few would so, deny that so the 10 percentage it, point increase in Labour share so of the vote was happened, a remarkable achievement. But if the election were rerun tomorrow, he still wouldn't win. Oh, no, that's that must not be true. a problem for you. Oh, no, that's not true. Well, well that's what the polls Well, say. no, 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 the polls don't show that. The polls show at the moment that uh, uh, both parties are neck and neck. We're back to a two-party state, as you yeah, we are. We pointed are. out we in are. your book. But the reality but given, is... But given the way that the, 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 reality the constituencies, you know, the, the votes are distributed between the constituencies, it is very difficult to see... If no, neck not neck, at all. Not, how Labour not at all, Robert. the government. Robert, not at all. What is evident from the polls at the moment, and remember how good the polls were last year, I mean, the truth of the matter is if there's an election and Corbyn is exposed once more to the British public, they will see what they seen last time, a decent, honourable man who's on their so side. So just to be clear, but, you, you retain 
full confidence in Jeremy Corbyn oh, absolutely. to lead Labour, in your view, absolutely. to a victory. Absolutely. If there was an election next week, then Corbyn would form a government. One thing is clear, even if you take the current opinion polls, the Tories couldn't form a government. They would fall short. They may still be the largest party, but they wouldn't be able to form a government. Labour would form a minority government and other parties would have to choose whether they were going to support the programme, this programme. Uh, you mentioned before about the authoritative electoral study and they said, well, it was more about this. <laughs> that just doesn't, uh, that just doesn't uh, fall into the reality of what I know from my members. Labour's manifesto gave hope. The very thing that you say in your... Uh, you know, that beautiful letter to your dad that is gone. Uh, the, the reality is Corbyn has performed a political miracle, the likes of which I've never seen in my life before. And what you had was hope driven back, especially amongst young people, hope uh, and a litany of things that people could look to and say, you know what, I I'm going to give this fella a chance. Now, it wasn't enough. Uh, you know, we had two horrible terrorist incidents uh, during the course of the election. The general view is that if the election had gone on another couple of weeks, Labour would have won it. In Scotland, I'm told by my colleagues up there, that Labour would have picked up another 10 seats in Scotland alone, had it gone on just a little bit further. So there's no doubt in my mind that whenever the next election comes, and if we've got to wait till 2022, then the nation will be poorer as a result of it. But whenever it comes, I believe Corbyn will win. And so did the British establishment, which is precisely why you have uh, all kinds of pressure on these Tory MPs not to kind of... M Theresa May's not going to be challenged at the moment. I, I, I remember... But here's a paradox for you, just out of interest. I mean, just, just, just so that you... Uh, 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 which I'm just going to put to you, which is, you know, you call the British establishment that single out a part of them, people who run big multinational companies. Um, there's quite a lot of Labour policy they don't like. They don't like the fact that corporation tax would go up under a Labour government. But they also say to me, actually, if Labour became explicitly the party, staying in the single market, even potentially keeping you know, the UK and the EU, they at that point might well back Labour. The hostility to Labour of what you call the establishment would at that point dissipate. The, the hostility to Labour will never dissipate because what Corbyn represents is uh, an attempt to bring about the irreversible shift in the balance of power in favour of working people. That's what the establishment desperately don't want and would move tooth and nail. We've, we've seen that during the election. You're talking about uh, corporations who say, well, you know, if Labour does this and if they've done that and if we can still earn our huge profits, then, you know, what's the problem? And that is the message that we give to all of the companies I deal with. They say, well, we don't mind the Labour government providing we're still able to operate in a climate where we can uh, um, earn profits, then uh, what's wrong with it? The other interesting thing from business, Robert, let me make this Please. quick point, is uh, a Labour government uh, being prepared to invest the British Investment Bank. Again, your book points out, points out how banks and how the crash and what Gordon Brown didn't do right. Uh, banks have been allowed to kind of effectively bring about an investment strike, uh, a, a, an investment freeze. And what we desperately need, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of small and medium businesses out there looking for loans. Labour will generate sustainable growth in our economy, not a bubble based on property and not and reintroduce the question of decent employment the very thing that you talked about in the last chapter sure. of your let's, book but let's, but let's just get back to this issue of power because it is important um, there's another aspect of power which is uh, I think completely relevant which is the gender imbalance so whatever you say about the Tory party they've now had two women prime ministers right the Labour, Labour Party He's a man. You're a man. Most trade unions are uh, run by middle-aged men. Yeah. What's gone wrong? 
interviewers who go, yeah me who, I mean, dominate, I mean, me. who dominate I mean, the media are men. Well, obviously, we, the, there is a need for uh, to. Uh, what are you doing reduce. about? It? What are you doing we within fight, your own union? Fight, are you going to be? Are you going to be succeeded by a woman in your? Uh, our membership will decide that. We're a democratic organisation. In my union, 50% of the senior jobs in my team are women. But let's just move away from an individual union, which has particular characteristics. You can't ask the railway union, well, what are you going to do? But it is interesting that the proportion no, of, ask, of women who are in trade unions is actually higher than the proportion of men, and yet women are not running trade unions. Well, it, that's not true. There are a number of women who are heading up trade unions at the moment, but the point... Not the biggest just, point. Uh, let me just make this point. The, you, you talk about what are we doing about inequality. All our lives, all my life, I've been fighting against inequality. All my life, I've been fighting for groups, uh, not only women, but black and Asian, ethnic minorities, LGBT, mm. disabled workers, the vulnerable and the poor. We fight for them all the time. We don't control uh, the government, unfortunately. If we did, it would be the type of it would be the type of nation that you longed for, that you think you've lost. BBC's just published ten most highest. Paid. And I bet you they're all they're, they're all white and they're all they're all men and, and they're, they're all white. What well, did you? Well, I, I've, that's clearly wrong. The BBC, this fantastic, you know, uh, organisation, although there's huge question marks over whether it's as uh, impartial as it used to be. And of course that should be giving a clear lead because it has the power to do that. It has the power to do that. Remember the, uh, the corporations, major corporations that all... Uh, CEOs, most of the CEOs. I'm trying to think if I've, if, if I'm, if I deal with a, a, a female CEO, I, and I can't think of one. These are powerful organisations. There's one actually at ITV. <laughs> these are powerful. <laughs> Karen McCall. These so, are powerful organisations that can make a difference. I'm concerned about women at the. Uh, rank and file, the factory four level, the office level, who always get um, a, a bad a, a bad deal, and the pay gender gap, despite the fact that it was a Labour government that introduced in the seventies these dark days of the seventies that you people in the media always talk about, when we had health and safety legislation introduced that has saved tens of thousands of lives, Equal Pay Act introduced, we've still got a gap. We fight for that every single day. Now, look, unfortunately, we're almost out of time. And one of the things I like to do is also, just at the end, sort of wrap up with something a bit more personal. Now, I've read, I've actually never spoken to you about this, that you love poetry. Is that right? I, I do, yeah. So, 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 so tell me a little bit about how you got into poetry, who your favourite poet is. Well, I, I mean, how I got into poetry was after school. It's one of the kind of condemnations I have about our system, working class people like me, poetry and theatre and uh, Shakespeare and opera was never really open to us. So it was, you know, perhaps in my late But who, introdu who introduced you to poetry? Was there somebody in your family? Was it a friend? How did you...? I, I, I came across poetry just out of uh, sheer... And accident, do, you read, do you read it today to relax? Do you... Yeah, I do. I do. Whenever I go on holiday, I always take a poetry book with me. I, I, well, what I, have you read recently? What would you recommend? Well, I love, um, love W.B. Yeats. I love uh, William Blake. I'm a big Blake fan. Uh, I often take books that are romantic and the, the favourite books. And, of course, I love Shelley, that great romantic revolutionary who made that call, that clarion call to working people who were being oppressed by an uncaring government when he said to them, rise like lions out of slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake to earth your chains like dew, which in sleep have fallen on you. Ye are many. They are few. That's a message that I constantly give to our members and to working people everywhere. People power can take back control of our nation. And the person who at the moment gives us that hope is Jeremy Corbyn and Labour. We can have a better Britain and a much better and peaceful world. Now, there'll world. be some people out there who don't agree with every word you say, but I imagine most people watching today will agree with you that they hope that the England team tonight rise like lions. lions. And on that note, I'm just going to say thank you very much, Len McCluskey. It's been a very interesting conversation.